Hey everyone, welcome to Punkcast. My name is William Maxwell. I'm a student of Web3 and the owner of Punk9527. CryptoPunks are 10,000 uniquely generated characters stored permanently on the Ethereum blockchain. No punk is the same. This is a show dedicated to celebrating the punks behind the punk. My hope for this podcast is that we capture the essence of the punk culture, elevate the brand and the individual behind the punk. One last thing, projects discussed in the show is not financial advice. Crypto and NFTs are a volatile and risky asset class. Please always do your own research. Other than that, let's go. Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of Punkcast. Today we're back with Punk 3706 with five attributes, big shades, black lipstick, earring, green tassel, and red nose. In real life, he's a favorite punk amongst punks and the founder of Avatars XYZ, an NFT avatar filter of video applications. Please welcome Crypto Novo to the show. Novo, how are you, man? Welcome all my aliens, apes, and zombies. I'm doing <laughs> wonderful. I always try to start off my uh, you know, conversations welcoming all my aliens, apes, and zombies because I want to include everyone. I don't care the gender. I don't care if you're an alien, ape, and zombies. And of course, you know, it goes out to the three rarest attributes in CryptoPunks, the aliens, apes, and zombies. Good to sort of include them all, but uh, nice to sort of finally have you on the show, Novo. I've um, been looking forward to having this conversation for quite some time. I think you've got a super fascinating story and uh, an NFT journey as well that I'd love to sort of unpack with you. But um, maybe we could just start with uh, a little bit about your handle, Crypto Novo. Of all the things you could have come up with, why Crypto Novo? Actually, Novo Crypto was taken. Um, there's a couple other ones that were already pre-taken. Uh, and I got into it because I wanted to start following people on, at the time, Twitter. Now it's X. And I wanted to follow people in cryptocurrency. I was, uh, you know, fascinated with um, finance in the sense that, uh, you know, I just wanted to find alternative means to the U.S. dollar and got into some Bitcoin and Ethereum. And that eventually evolved into almost the next process is like, what do you spend cryptocurrency on? You know, you could spend it on pizza. You know, what do you really spend Ethereum on? So I was kind of looking for outlets what you can do with uh, spending Ethereum on. And um, branched into a conversation one day with actually an athletic director at a school because I was a teacher at the time. And uh, I was speaking with him and he's like, yeah, my my buddy, uh, my athletic director said this, his his friend actually sold uh, the, the crypto ape that almost started the first initial run. You know, it was, it was crypto punk ape and it was like the first one that really got traction on Twitter. And I started looking into it and I'm like, well, you know, these things kind of look cool. There's the, a collectability to it. It's the first somewhat tangible thing that, you know, can fall off the blockchain, I would say, in the, in the form of digital art. So um, May 26, 20, 2020, I bought my first crypto punk for an Ethereum. Um, at the time, Ethereum was, I'm sorry, that was April 27th. At the time, Ethereum was $196. Wow. So I, I figured, you know, this is maybe like buying a first comic book, you know, a, a first appearance of, I don't know, Deadpool of a comic book back then, just probably worth a heck of a lot more now. And I, I, I wanted to look more into it. That was uh, super early. I think you got in, you know, marginally early than, um, than when the, the crypto sort of bull run came through. I do want to d delve into your crypto sort of punk selection journey uh, in a moment, but love to sort of unpack a little bit more about your background. You, you mentioned um, a little bit about you being a teacher. C could you share a little bit about, you know, everything about you leading, uh, you know, before leading up to sort of crypto? Yeah, sure. Um, physical education teacher, uh, kindergarten through eighth grade. Uh, at the time of graduating college, there was really not um, a lot of laptops. There was um, computer labs at the time. So a lot of this stuff I had to do and I found out was pretty much just done on cell phone for the most part. So being a physical education teacher, all teachers have side hustles. My side hustle was just looking into alternative means of trying to stay two steps ahead. In high school, in the dot-com era, I wanted to start buying stocks when I was 
17, 18 years old in that range. And you really couldn't do it rather than picking up a hard line phone or a rotary phone and calling someone. Cell phones really weren't a thing unless you had to block uh, cell phones. And so when E-Trade came out, I asked mom and dad for a $1,000 because that's how much it costs to open an E-Trade account. And I bought E-Trade through E-Trade. So I signed up for the E-Trade account and I actually bought the stock E-Trade uh, one of the first weeks it was available. I figured, well, this is a trading platform and it's going to be dealing with stocks and it's all about kind of micro transactions. It doesn't matter if the stock market goes up or down, if people are going to buy into it. and and I bought and sold it. And then next thing I know, I bought Apple stock. I bought it for 12 bucks. And man, I thought I was super rich when I sold it for $16. Yep, you're right. <laughs> and I was in college and that helped pay for books. And that, you know, that helped got, get me through at that time. So I almost saw it as markets were cyclical in the sense that when this Web3 came out, all these platforms started coming. Um, you know, on Coinbase, you can only get Bitcoin and Ethereum. Well, how would you get X, you know, Ripple? How would, how would, you, how would you get XRP? So then I, I did my due diligence, dug on the internet and found out how to, you know, get into different types of altcoins, all while just being a teacher on my cell phone, uh, spending all my free time just not watching TV. Uh, not playing little cell phone games or anything like that, just digging on Twitter and just finding any outlets to read about this new technology, who's in it, wh what's going next. And then that alt summer came and just like any altcoin you touch, if, as long as you can know how to get it, someone would tweet about it and it would just rock it 10, 20, 30%. And you just take those gains and stack them, stack them, stack them. And then all of a sudden you hear about crypto punks through a coworker. And, you know, from that, just really spent my time just looking into it and then figuring out what Discord was. And that was the game changer. All, all this, keep in mind, was on my cell phone. So hopping into Discord and the first person who tweeted back to me was Snowfro. And Snowfro just kind of just like, this is how you buy and sell these things. This is the website. This is. It gets stored here and just really walks me through it, just onboarded me. And same thing as being a teacher, you have to be a student to learn, but I took that knowledge and was, you know, able to teach others. That's cool. You, you start off as a PT teacher. And the question I normally ask most people is of all the things you could have chosen, what and how did you get into, you know, teaching PT for, uh, for students? Physical education was a simple uh, outlet for me. Um, one, um, as a student growing up, I, you know, was the one that had ants in their pants, the one that fidgeted a lot. So, even right now, interviewing with you, I'm standing up. I like standing up. I don't like being seated. My strengths were hands-on. You know, using my athletic ability. Though I'm not a very big person, I was rather quick. And entering into high school. There was a physical education teacher, and I'm like, I want that guy's job. I get to play sports all day. You know, kids are always super happy to come into class. You know, I I don't have to sit at a desk. You you don't really have a boss. You know, you're you're a leader, and you get to build teams. And that's what I was interested in doing is building things and communicating and talking with people and socializing. And all my friends were kind of in that same boat. We were all just not real super great athletes, but just enjoyed sports, enjoyed being outside, enjoyed swimming, enjoyed playing basketball. And it was very simple for me to realize what a better career path than just play all day, especially playing with, you know, children who, I mean, pretty much the same year in, year out, you know, different grade levels, different pedagogies, different things you're trying to teach them so then they can progress to be better citizens in the society. And all that was important to me, you know, all that um, giving back to a community that gave so much to me because I saw it through the great teachers that, you know, taught me and influenced me. And there's tons of people that I find in this, you know, Web3 world that had great uh, either art teachers or, or great computer science teachers that, you know, led them to their career path that they chose. So uh, props to the teachers out there and 
you know, sometimes I'll give myself a pat on the back for, you know, helping educate the next uh, wave of, uh, of people that are hopefully going to be positive people in the world. Absolutely. Right. Um, I, I gotta say, I think teachers are probably some of the biggest unsung heroes. Um, I, I know I put my middle school teachers through uh, a bit of pain and grief uh, in, the, in those earlier days, but did, did you um, specialize in any particular year grades or um, was it sort of broad? Uh, mostly gym, physical education, gym classes, uh, health classes. I also have a minor in political science. I have a master's in um, administrative leadership. So um, back to building teams, you know, I, I, I could be a principal, a superintendent, athletic director, but there again, suit and tie, you know, it, for, to visualize so people, people uh, see, see what Max is looking at. I, I'm wearing a Wookiee onesie. <laughs> um, with an AR filter on. So I just want to be relaxed and comfortable. So, um, you know, being able to, you know, roll, teach a kid how to play kickball or show someone how to grab, uh, grasp something or catch something or showing conflict resolution through rock, paper, scissors is just fun. It's just cool and it's never dull. And there's always new challenges, but yet important information you can pass on. To- Are they high school kids or primary school kids that you were mostly teaching? Cause- Kindergarten through eighth grade. So I'd have the knee hires who I'm teaching them to tie the shoes to the, you know, I, I would, I would teach sex ed to kids, you know, so, uh, you know, teach thing, teaching them about relationships, teaching them about family, teaching them about birds and the bees. Like those are the, the steps in life. You know, it's, it's, it's weird. Cause like you're saying like to put the stuff you put your teachers through, like <laughs> I get it coming back to me tenfold, right. You know, what goes around, comes around that comes tenfold back to me, you know, cause I probably wasn't the most, uh, uh, like I said, I was a little antsy in class. Yeah. Uh, well, I think you've got them, the kids during the best part of the years, right. In the early sort of stages where they're, they're quite sweet, um, and sort of the formative years, I think, I think from grade nine onwards, I think that's when the, uh, the, uh, the bad behavior sort of starts coming out. They'll test your boundaries. Yep. But that's what they do. They challenge that. They see what they can do. And that's kind of where they find themselves too, is the, you know, that high school age. That's cool. And uh, yeah, so, so I guess that gives you, give us a little bit of color about, I guess, who you are as a person. I mean, I mean, to be a school teacher, you need to be quite good with communicating, uh, as you sort of said, leadership and, uh, and and in some ways patient as well, right? Um, which is kind of cool. And and then and then so you're doing that for the most part out of out of out of university. And then you had a bit of a side hustle. Um and most of your side hustle is really around investments and everything else. So, so when did you start investing? Like wh- wh- how long ago was that when you first got your e trade account set up? I I'll even rewind further back to that. I started investing when I buy comic books and not even read them and put them right in the sleeve, like right away. And best there again, best friends that are with still with me, like living my, like right down the door from me, a couple miles from me, one from kindergarten. And we just liked to collect baseball cards and comic books. And we go to, we went to the first couple wizard worlds, which are now comic cons and get stuff, st- stuff signed by Jim Lee. And, you know, Stan Lee was walking around too. You can just walk up to him. And like, it was to the point, like you'd see Stan Lee so many times you didn't even bother like asking him for an autograph, but we were eight, nine, 10, 11 years old, you know, and our parents, you know, would work hard, blue collar workers. Dad was a baggage handler at American Airlines for 47 years. Mom stayed at home until you know, we moved into the new, a new, a newer house and they had to make ends meet. So she went, she went working at a bank as a, as a bank teller and neither of them college educated at all, just grinded to help stay to that lower middle class. Um, we were in a pretty affluent area, so they just wanted the best school for their, myself and my sister. And then that investments, you know, just slowed in, just turned into like, we didn't have a lot of toys growing up. So like the toy you had, man, like you burn it with a magnifying glass or buried <laughs> in the sandbox. That was it till next Christmas or your birthday or whatever. So like being thrifty, being resourceful, my first car I had, it was, my parents told me you're either going to get a job or you're going to have to build it. And me and my dad built my first car. What, um, what, what was, was your first car? 
It was an 84 Jeep Wrangler. Oh, that's cool. From the engine block and the frame. And then from the firewall back, we replaced it with an 89 Jeep because it was all rusted out. Um, it had monster truck tires. Uh, it was a truck that my best friend and my dad's best friend, they drove um, when they were growing up. They got in 84 and that turned into my car. So that's what me and my dad gear wrenched on. Yeah. So going back a little bit, I think you mentioned collectibles, and I think this is like an important point because I think probably links to NFTs in some ways because I, I can relate to that as well, collect being, collecting basketball cards growing up in Australia. I mean, what sort of comics and, and cards did you sort of collect? And um, and I guess what why did you collect back then, do you think? I like organizing things. I like things in order. So like when you got those first couple packs of baseball cards, like, you know, you wanted all the Cubs players because we lived in Chicago. You know, then you wanted all the Sox players because you lived in Chicago. And then you, you know, wanted all the Cardinals players because you'd always see them on WGN TV playing the Cubs. And then, you know, every once in a while, another team would come into town. So then, then all of a sudden you're riding your bikes to the baseball card shop and, you know, buying packs of cards for 50 or 25 cents that you're finding in couch cushions. And that's just what you did growing up. Those were the good old days before, you know, these kids are on these cell phones staring at nonsense. So back to the collect the, the collecting part of it. This is what we did as friends growing up. You know, it's, that was Americana for us. And we were in a melting pot. Like it was, and all our friends were from an airbase, from a trailer park, from, uber rich houses you know parents working at you know um so and no one really knew the difference we just rode bikes and it was awesome it was cool and it's the same people we're still chilling with today so that was just kind of a, a way very similar and, and it probably does come back to it, it's your flex you know in the game too like hey i got the griffy rookie hey i got the uh the F face, you know, baseball uh, bat that, you know, uh, Cal Ripken had on the bottom of it, or maybe it was a different uh, player. So you'd want to collect those cards and, you know, have the bragging rights at school the next day that you had that and show off your binder, very similar to Pokemon, you know, and it kind of stems back to crypto punks too, or you're trying to level up, you know, you're trying to get that alien ape or zombie. You're trying to get that hoodie. Maybe you're just trying to get that crypto punk, you know? So it was that same thought process. My main collection was uh, X-Men, but like it's to the point now with me and my best friend, we almost have every single Marvel comic outside of Amazing Fantasy 15, Fantastic Four One. We've had a couple Hulk ones. We've like, we've gone through them. So like, that's what we do now. Like, and we don't like, we sell them to buy more of our collection, like more to collect, you know, to support our habits. So yeah. Are the comics worth much now? Compared to what I bought them for when I was, yes. And first appearances, yes. But, you know, they're only worth it if you sell them. But, like, I'll pull a comic book and I'll, I'll know exactly what road trip we got it at. You know, so now I'm the sentimental attachments to it. You know, very similar to, like, hearing your favorite song or, you know, having your favorite dish to eat. Like, that's what's instilled in my, you know, that's stamped in my memory set forever. You know, and you know, if my, they get passed down to the next generation of my kids and they sell it off, like whatever. But, you know, for me, that's my, uh, you know, that's, that's part of me. It's part of the DNA, I guess. Yeah. I think, I think we can know most of us can sort of relate to that. Right. And I think there's something nostalgic about crypto punk. And I think there's something nostalgic about growing up in that era. I think most of us can relate, you know, video games, comic books, trading cards, playing sports and the like as well. And it's sort of like almost feels a little bit uh, um, of that Stranger Things vibes, right? You know, a bunch of street kids riding around on bikes and just hanging out. And I think that's why that show's so popular because that brings back the good old days when things were just so harmless and innocent. And like, really, the only thing you had to worry about is just like, you know, making sure you're home for dinner when you hear the whistle or the triangle bell ring, you know, it's just like the innocence of life, you know? Yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it was super nice. I think when you started talking about, you know, what, you know, certain music can sort of transport you back to certain moments in time as well. And, um, I do remember just buying, um, just random CDs and 
you know, because we didn't have Spotify, we would just play the CD on repeat. You'd play you know, that silver day. chair, like, <laughs> you know, the frogs were stomping, man. I played that silver chair like no other. Those Aussies, they they rocked it down there. <laughs> do. Absolutely. Oh, man. T- take us back to memory lane. But, 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 and, and I think this is all relevant in terms of, you know, what, you know, part of the reason why we, 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 we value punk so much is because it, it sort of feels like it just captures the essence of, of this really, really nicely. Um, Max, it's no different than like a car club, you know, seeing like hot rods, you know, like that's their club. That's what they roll with, you know, there's street rods and then there's racing clubs, you know, and then there's sailboating and then it's the same thing. It's just, it's, it's our club, you know, and yeah, maybe they have an attached value on them. That's more than anyone would even fathom paying or looking at, but like, for me, it's the digital rookie card. You know, that's my mindset. Very collectible because the club that it's in, it's worth the members of what the club would pay for it. Maybe not the normal person, but, you know, is the normal person buying hunks of gold either? What's the value of gold? Yeah, there is value in gold, you know, and it can be actually be used for something. Crypto punks could be used for something too because people view it now and they see it as a way of connecting with someone who might be either like-minded, tech savvy, lucky, rich, whatever, but it, uh, it gives you that association, that symbol, you know, and that symbol could be anything. It could be your religious association. It could be the school you went to, a tattoo. It could be your hair color. It could be anything. Yeah. Uh, it definitely keeps us connected. Well, well mate, mate, just, just transitioning from, I guess, from comic books and collectibles and cards and, and the like, when you came across NFTs, like, what did you make of it? Like, you know, with the context of, you know, your collectability um, sort of history, you know, what was your first NFT and how did you cross that path to, to go off and buy one? And what was your first NFT actually? It was a crypto, it was that crypto punk. It was crypto punk 2080. Wow. Um, I saw it and I wanted to get something that looked like a crypto punk. So it had a, a vape pen, which I thought just like was maybe more crypto is a new in 2020 is maybe a, a new age cigarette and then punk um with the purple hair like being a punk rocker and i just looked at it, i'm like i think this looks pretty pretty dope like this is pretty good and then i based that also on the purple hair rarity class um and i saw the next level up in the purple hair was like one i don't know whatever it was 1.25 ethereum so i'm like well, maybe I can make 30 bucks off of this. Like, I'm just going to repost this and make a grand total $30 off this. And then when I bought it, you know, it went up on my PFP on, on Twitter and no one ever followed me on Twitter at all. And then all of a sudden, I, all these people started following me and they're all other crypto punk uh, owners. Hey, what's going on? Welcome to the club. So I'm just like, all right, well, I didn't know this was going to happen. And then I went into Discord to ask how to sell it. And that's where Snowfro came in and kind of just kind of gave me a little bit of the rundown, like, you know, this, that, the other thing, or it wasn't, uh, maybe it was uh, Tony Herrero was, was the one who, who actually to go to the website, to sell it on the website, because I didn't really know how to like go about how to sell it. That first crypto punk was later sold September 15th, 2021 for 120 Ethereum. So I diamond handed that for, you know, uh, April 27th to September 15th. So almost, almost like a, a whole year. Yep. And the value on that was $427,000. That's insane. From, I'm just looking at the records now from a one ETH buy, which was $196. So you went from 126 US dollars to 427,000. And look, and look what I said no to on all, all right. I think I maybe I, I, I offered uh like a ridiculous amount on most of it right offered all yeah there's only a couple bids uh what a crazy run so how did how did you initially hear about crypto punks and what made you sort of buy nfts would have was that like a big shift mental shift for you you know digital assets or how how are you sort of navigating through that sort of concept back then kind of wanted to find i kind of wanted to find an off ramp for ethereum a reason to, I guess, sell Ethereum at the time because, I mean, I'm going to look at the coin market cap here real quick. Because um, I, I believe, right, like, well before then, you know, Ethereum was doing pretty healthy. 
and I had, you know, skin in the game. So I think it got up to like, what was it? 1200 bucks in like 18. Yeah, there it is. Uh, in 2018, I got up to like $1,200. So I remember selling a little bit then, and then it just like went down and I just, I'm like, all right, well, I'll just continue dollar cost averaging. And it was just kind of just sitting there for almost like three years. And actually, here's why I started dollar cost averaging. Um, I, I live in Chicago. Uh, we play 16 inch softball. It's bare hand softball. Um, and a lot of, a lot of people just <laughs> break fingers playing this game. Um, well, anyhow, you know, I guess the tradition, you're, you're sponsored by a bar. So you go out to the bar and, you know, you can pretty much get free drinks after the games and, you know, you leave money on the table for a tip, this or that. And it wasn't that I was drinking a lot or even whatever, but it was just putting $20, you know, every Thursday on the table. I'm like, you know, that's 80, a hundred dollars I'm just putting on the table and I'm really only having like a beer or two. I'm not a big drinker and really never was. I'm like, you know what, I'm going to stop drinking, even including at restaurants, you know, and take that money in dollar cost average. And I just put in $20, $30 a week and just buy a little bit of Ethereum, buy a little of Ethereum. So then when I had a chance of kind of buying something cool with Ethereum, um, I bought CryptoPunks or a CryptoPunk, um, which turned into more CryptoPunks because, you know, you're, I don't want to say you get in the flipping game, but you saw, you see what crypto punks to buy at the right time and you're able to you know take up you know maybe a tassel hat or is is the purple hairs that we're we're into a lot so i think i had two of them so you know i had one that was there that i knew i wasn't going to sell wasn't going to be in the ecosystem you can see the ones that were in the other wallets the ones that were active the ones that weren't active and there really wasn't too many being traded around so then you just set the floor price a little higher and someone would buy it and then keep that money back in the ecosystem and the crypto punks just took off one day the the, the day that uh visa um bought their crypto punk. yeah i remember that that was crazy yeah the the, the floors are getting swept i think some funds came in i think gary v sort of swept a few punks around that time as well um it was uh, absolutely euphoric man what, what what a crazy sort of times just and just going back a little bit too, just to ask you a point around ethereum i mean you had the choice of bitcoin and ethereum but you kept dollar cost averaging into ethereum um what made you do that i liked it whole things so i wanted to like i didn't like satoshis you know i'm like i'm never going to be able to collect an entire bitcoin um so i was like trying to like like hey if i have three ethereum four ethereum and then i also um you know was getting i got into xrp i think at like three cents or maybe i think it was like 2.9 cents um, I remember like getting in before I got on Coinbase. So then my next thought process is like, man, I got to find all these altcoins before they get on Coinbase. Like there's got to be, there's got to be some information out there of like, what's going to be the next ones on Coinbase and Coinbase would publicly release the next ones that they were looking into getting. So then I would just put maybe, you know, $25, $30 in each one of those altcoins and sure enough, one or two of them would eventually arrive on coin on Coinbase, like they said, and the, those would just skyrocket because now people can buy them on Coinbase. So I was able to pretty much just get it on Uniswap, any of those platforms, before it would get put into a major platform. Fortunately, unfortunately, I believe that's kind of what happens in the stock market. You know, like the, the E trade, like we said before, I don't know any of this to be factual, so don't have any of this again. But a platform. Before they sell it to the normal consumer, they can probably already have bags of it already loaded up and they just maybe sell it off a little bit percentage off to the next guy. So then they're making their gains and their followings and then they can move it through. So um, I don't know. I just try to stay two steps ahead. And then I saw the rest of the flow coming into the altcoins. So I'm like, well, what's going to be next in all of this? Like altcoin this, altcoin that. There's an altcoin for everything. Like what's going to be next? And then when I saw these digital collectibles, when the CryptoPunk ape got sold, it was just like, look, someone bought this ape for $30,000 and, you know, it had a whole bunch of tweets. I'm like, well, this is probably going to be it. You know, people are on Twitter. People are, you know, kind of liking or there's conversation about it. A lot of people actually didn't like it. Like, why would someone spend this much money on that? 
And I saw it, I was like, well, this is pretty collectible. And then you just go to the website and you read that, you know, it's essentially first digital collectible that you can think of, at least at the time you can think of, you know, some of them might outpace it in front, you know, I've seen a couple that may have outdated it, but who cares? Yeah. No, man, you, you, well, you definitely made the right bets, man. Jeez. I mean, you backed Ethereum early and um, picked punks when you could have, could have easily picked something else, right? And maybe Crypto Kitties or some other uh, NFTs. But um, wow! But it was nerding out. I mean, I, I I watch Chicago Bears football. I really don't watch TV at all. You know, maybe Marvel movies when they're in the theaters. But like, I dedicated my time towards that after pretty much finishing my educational process. Because like, you, heck, I was going to school. For, I probably went to school for thirty five years of my life. You know, like. And then supplement that time. I shouldn't say supplement it, but, you know, keep the, allocate time properly. That's what I try to do the best. Yeah. And I want to, I want to ask you a little bit about the punk community uh, in just a moment, but I just want to ask you with your current punk, uh, 3706, of all the punks that you've bought and sold, I think you've sort of had, you know, 26 odd punks that you sort of bought and sold. What, what was it about 3706 with, the big glasses, the tassel, and the red nose that uh, that you wanted to make it your you know Web three identity. Family, 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 family. Uh, my niece heard about what I was doing with CryptoPunks, saw it on Twitter. Younger, she was fifteen at the time, and she made a YouTube video about CryptoPunks. And I'm like, wait a second. You're making a YouTube video about CryptoPunks and I'm not. So we started talking together and I'm like, I'll take the CryptoPunk talking over. You can continue, you know, doing research, learning about this stuff yourself. And she started the wave of me kind of streaming. Um, That was also brought upon COVID as well, pandemic, because being a physical education teacher, rewind, I never owned my own computer. I never owned my own computer until about, I think I've had this computer almost two years now. So like I, this was all on cell phone. So like to make YouTube videos, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have a computer to make it on, you know? Um, so my niece did. So we figured, figured a way through this fast forward to why 3706. 3706, I brought up a bunch of crypto punks. They're again staying two steps ahead. I suggested to John and Matt to maybe add, after they said, hey, we're going to maybe add some things to the website. Any suggestions? I suggested, how about you put the different attributes within the hierarchy in there? Like the zero, the, the one attribute, the two, this, you know, Danny's seed phrase set all the way up to seven within it. And then also I suggested um, skin tone variations as well, which both of those were shared to me early on Discord, like super early on Discord. Like someone's like, hey, here, here's a Google that we had Google sheets of floor prices of all these punks and all these mathematical equations and all this and all that. Well, anyhow, John and Matt added that to the website is um, the rarity classes uh, all the way at the bottom of the attribute classes. So I wanted to try to get Um, any six traits, which they were out of my price range. So I'm like, well, the next frontier is going to be these five traits. If you, if you look through there, I have, uh, uh, I think uh, I should have my crypto punks up right now, but um, I bought a couple five traits just to kind of see like, Hey, maybe they're going to add this to to the website. So I brought a couple five traits, presented them to the family and uh, my daughter and wife really didn't care to tell you the truth, but my son's just like, I think you should buy that one. And he pointed right to 3706. And I go, why? And he goes, cause that one looks the coolest. And that's all he said. <laughs> and I think it was like a day or two later. Um, uh, we were looking at the punks again. He's like, yeah, it's the one I picked out. I go, do you know that one's a female? And he goes, I don't care that that one looks the coolest. Like that has the best colors. It, 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 and it had the most colors out of all of them, you know, had the, the nose, it had the, the three shades of purple, the blue, the green. And what I truly liked about it, which I thought was was dope, which he probably doesn't even, even realize right now, is the hidden trait on it. 
the uh, the golden earring behind uh, what what is it? Or you can look at my air filter. I have it on my air filter. Right there. Yeah, uh, behind, I see it. behind the ear. And then the other one is the visual hidden trait, which people often overlook, is the black lipstick. So like the black lipstick just looks like normal lips, but the black lipstick adds to the fifth trait. So the tassel hat, big shades, clown nose, black lipstick, and then the hidden the hidden earring there. So those were things that were like cool talking points. And I, I kind of like the clown nose. I, th- I think that like kind of like stood out um, to me. And then the big shades were also kind of a, a, one of those uh, popular, maybe more popular than the statistics would show, I would say. Very similar to like the hoodies, you know, where, you know, they have a little bit more uh, popularity maybe to the look of them. Uh, very similar to the purple caps, you know, just by just by ranking of stats compared to aesthetic or art. Art is all in the eye of the beholder. Yeah, that's super fascinating. And and, and I guess, Novo, you, you've definitely made this one your own you know super iconic as soon as i sort of see the tassel i automatically think uh crypto nova i'm sure many others do as well um uh, to be honest i don't even know i'll be speaking a tune here i don't know if there's any other notable punk that rock a tassel tassel hat other than yourself that sort of come to mind but it's also interesting that you started talking about traits because i think or attribute counts because i don't i think it's often overlooked and i know um uh, there was a single attribute that got sold to uh no, it was, it was a zero attribute that got sold to um, uh, Token Angels last last week for about 500 ETH, which was, was crazy. And uh, and I think, you know, the variability in terms of the ways that you can sort of collect punks is really, really cool. And you spoke about five attributes, and I'm looking here, there's 166 five attributes in the collection, so it's quite rare. The, the floor on those is sort of 75. As you go up to the next level, a six attribute is 190 ETH. And obviously, Danny C. Fraser's got the uh, the only sort of seven attribute that's out there. Um, and you really can't put a value on that, right? So, like the zero yeah. trait, you know, like what are the comparisons? You know, it's it's and it's fun. It's it's super fun, you know. Yeah, and that and that that was the part of the collectability of it is like we would we uh, punks Discord would nerd out on that. Like I, I submitted some stuff to the punks book, and it was like you know. Like stuff that people would send me on Discord or like here are like screenshots of, you know, their Google Sheets that would have like equations, floor prices of this and that. And like, man, people went hardcore into that. And it was like back to the collectability thing of like, you know, where is that Hulk 181 with the the Marvel stamp in there, the first Wolverine? You know, where where is the first Rocket Raccoon? You know, it, things like that. Like people wouldn't know, but people know and all you had to do is ask and tell them and they'd be happy to share that information with you is, is there any um anything else that was sort of missing that, in terms of what was discussed in terms of collectability because i know there was a bit of a thing around dev punks right so if your serial was less than a thousand that was a thing people thinking about it from attributes um hidden traits is an interesting one um uh was there any other sort of aspects that you guys were looking at but back in the day, like there's a lot more personalities that like, you know, you wouldn't touch the beanie puck because it was beanie, you know, and there's like, there's certain ones, you know, like art chick, you really didn't get, uh, I forgot that the hair type that she had, but like you, you would almost just stay away. Cause that was like almost its own personality type or like, Hey, I kind of want to have my own thing going on over here, you know? So like Tony Herrera is another one, like, you know, you just, you didn't go with that buck tooth clown hair. Cause you know, like that's that's tony herrera type thing you know but like those personalities started coming out so like it kind of spurred people i don't know if this maybe spurred g money but like you know as soon as he got it bang that's it you know that's 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 g for you and like so those things started creating the again hierarchy of the collectability but now you're part of that so-called collection because you're part of that community and that community views you as that person and that person, yeah, it does get you some tweets, but your name's behind it, you know, and that's all part of it is your name is behind it. And the value on that is the people who follow you, the people that give you the retweets and the likes. Do, you, do they call them retweets anymore or do they call them reacts? Re, re, reposts, which is kind of weird. <laughs> oh, man, it was a crazy time. If you can look back to um, the early days of Discord, like, do you remember like what the vibe was like? Could you describe that 
like what the vibe was and I guess who was sort of in there at that time? You can ask anyone anything and I was just someone just trying to soak up any information. And then it was just like, wait, wait a second. You can video chat and actually talk to someone on Discord so I don't actually have to type. Because back to again, being physical education, I'd rather just talk and communicate and just be more personable and talk to someone. So then it is like talking to Tony Herrera and DJing with him. And then all of a sudden you're talking to like, a true OG. I'm not an OG because I didn't mint, you know, people call me an OG. I bought for $200. If there's a definitive line between that, I'll give it to the true OGs, the people who minted, but that's neither here nor there. But his knowledge base of years of experience within NFTs, within blockchain security, within, man, he, he pretty much had the solution to almost immigration on on chain through like a physical card. It, it's crazy. Like, and this is like, who, who, who are you talking about? Tony Herrera. Tony Herrera. Yeah. Like yeah. it's stuff like that. You're like, man, this guy is absolutely freaking brilliant. I could sit in here with like a pretty much a professor, a doctoral in, and just make, <laughs> and he thinks it's cool talking to an AR filter, like game on, like I'm game for this. And actually I probably didn't have the AR, AR filter back then, but eventually grew into it. But then it's like, prank, another one, Pranksy. You can chat with Pranksy, type in with Pranksy. That led into the distribution of 150 crypto punks through the through the raffle. Um, that's the, one of the first collaborations that you know that we were able to do. Um, so it was able that everyone was trying to grow, help each other grow, and it turned into like cryptoed, as I call them, but it's crypto. Um, he's just like, hey, you want to you want to beta beta test NBA Top Shot? You know, Dapper Labs is is knocking at the door. You want to beta test NBA Top Shot? Hey, you know, what's, what's going on over here with art blocks? Hey, what's, you know, I remember John and Matt trying to get me to not pushing me, not shilling me, but saying like, Hey, you should probably get one of these autoglyphs. And I was like, I don't, I remember like, I don't really like that type of art. What a, what a damn <laughs> fool I am, you know? But like, that was the communication links going around. And those people are some of the pioneers in the space now. And they're the same people that, they reach out to me, I'll help them. If I had to reach out to me, they'd be able to help me, which they all helped contribute getting my punk back. So it's just like, we're here for each other. We pick each other up when needed, support each other. And it, it doesn't take much just to give a like or a repost, you know, if you like what they're doing, you know, it takes a second. Such a, such an OG crew and a highly networked crew. I mean, Tony Herrera, Pranksy, spoke about, you know, Matt and John, huge, huge names in the space. And so you, you didn't buy an autoglyph, like you, you just, you, you didn't like the gen art or? Yeah, I, would, I was just so focused on crypto punks, wanted to stay in my lane, wanted to stay in my avenue, very, very much so even, you know, somewhat today as well, or I didn't really branch out, you know, too, too far. I didn't, I had an opportunity to mint a board ape, did not, I the same week I minted, uh, I'm a degen voids because I like the technology. You know, they're fully rigged. You can pull into VR and I'm like, this is the next wave. This is going to be the next thing. Everything's going to be in VR. You know, they're fully rigged. And I went that direction, which eventually led to, you know, my first NFTs in, in, in VR. It was it led me down a path that I'm proud to have, to have taken. You, you, you mentioned a story uh, that Pranksy raffled off 150 punks. Can you share a little bit about what that was? Uh, it was sort of before my time, and I have heard this story before. But Yes. Franksy shout out a tweet. Raffling. I don't know if they call that a raffle. Let me can't exactly. Well, let me just click a couple buttons here and see what they called it. It was called what I believe. Oh, this is recorded. So if I'm wrong, you know, please feel free to tweet me or DM me that I'm wrong. What I believe happened is Pranksy was was trying to help distribute more crypto punks throughout the community. So he set up a raffle where you bought a, a crypto punk for, or you bought a, a ticket, excuse me, that guaranteed you a crypto punk. You didn't know which one you were going to get, but it was going to be one of these 150 crypto punks. And you know some were rarer than others by you know their different attribute classes. So it was a way of onboarding people, a way of getting people a crypto punk. And I forgot what the official ticket price was but by the time the actual raffle started punks were well worth more than what the ticket prices were so if you got a ticket it was 
I don't know if it was like seven or eleven Ethereum, but at the time of CryptoPunks going off, I think they were like fourteen to sixteen Ethereum. I could be wrong on it. So it was a great way of distributing CryptoPunks, which were, I believe, all developer punks. For those of you listening, developer punks or CryptoPunk zero through a thousand. There is CryptoPunk zero. All right. So first thousand, uh, these were all. So they were all developer punks, dev punks. So. It was an opportunity to get a crypto punk somewhere in the range of zero to a thousand different numbers mixed in there. And he, a Franksy said, who wants to collab? And he wanted to broadcast it. So we had broadcasting capabilities to put it on multiple platforms. And I had the AR filter on. And at the time, just like anyone else, he was, he was working. Like he had a regular job. and. Being an artist in with avatars in the Web3 space, um, that was his side hustle. So we had to find a time, which was like after work from him, for him in London. So it's like midnight to 2 a.m. for him and, you know, whatever okay time for us. And we spun this digital wheel that was linked to each person's raffle ticket that would distribute a CryptoPunk into that raffle ticket. So he spun this wheel and he'd be like, all right, wallet number, whatever it was, you're going to be getting this or no, he'd spin the crypto punk and then it would match with a wallet. So like he'd scrim the pickle, like, all right, this wallet's getting this crypto punk and so on and so forth with, you know, there was some celebrity types in there. We did make an agreement that we wanted to, after distributing the crypto punks, because we didn't know all of the owners to kind of keep it a little anonymous so we don't really retweet it or share that information just for security reasons and that was Frank C and I respect that and you know appreciate him uh inviting us but it was two days um I think myself uh, I, I shouldn't think it was myself and uh Spotty Wi-Fi were the ho- uh, co-hosts uh Frank C was there and we'd just spin and talk punks and I would sit there and talk attribute class uh different attribute classes we'd talk about you know, what wallets they were going into because they were famous people at the time. And to look back that 150 crypto punks being distributed to pretty much huge alphas in the Web 2 and Web 3 world is absolutely crazy right now. Yeah. And any any names worth mentioning that we know? I think Gary V, Mark Cuban. Uh, there was, those are probably the two big ones. I think there was like three or four more. And then there was just like a couple of this like, they wanted to get a crypto punk. They didn't really know how to do it so formally. They wanted to get it randomly in there. They wanted a dev punk. They wanted to stay anonymous. So we just cranked through it two days. Oh man, that's cool. What a what, what a period. You mentioned Gary V. You worked with Vayner for a little bit, right? All right. Yep. Here we go. So I noticed some of my crypto punks that I was buying would. Um, AJ start was was buying buying the same ones that were kind of coming out of my wallet. So then, eventually, AJ's uh, G- G- Gary's brother, right? Brother, correct. Uh, there was a uh, purple hat VR albino female that I bought because I thought that was the closest thing that would look like an alien. And in prior our, uh, post conversations, uh, he said the exact same thing. Like that was the closest thing looking like an alien. And plus, they're big purple hat fans. And on Discord, another crypto punk who wanted to remain anonymous, who was a coworker, um, he's like, hey, you want to talk to Gary? I was like, kind of like, for what? Because I'm not really, I don't need to go talk to people, you know, like for what? He's like, I don't know. I think he wants to like ask you a couple questions, maybe offer you a job. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm, I'm fine teaching, doing fine with crypto punks. Like, <laughs> like I, think you sh- I think you should take the call. So I'm like, cool. So. We got linked up on at his phone but, number. Actually, and, m- m- maybe you can explain uh, who Gary V is. I think most people should know, but for those that don't, uh, who is Gary V? Um, Gary V grew up on the East Coast. Um, his family had a, um, a liquor store, beverage company that started having distribution and being able to like ship liquor and. He was an entrepreneur that just grasped off of his parents' uh, hard work and just turned into almost a uh, celebrity type uh, uh, 
owner of 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 a of a media company and uh, a very nice hard working well connected person very similar to an e- Elon Musk but maybe not in the billionaire range um and all over the news but uh within the east coast and the US like pretty darn popular and he has evolved the web3 space with v friends and has been a huge advocate of art uh collection and just kind of trying to format a, a new wave of thinking in, in advertising, collecting, and uh, uh, networking. So he's a, he's a big dog in the space. And he, he offered you a job, basically. Yeah, so I, he offered me a job, and I politely said, thank you, but no thank you. I am enjoying what I'm doing, being a teacher. Like, I'm, you know, doing what I want to be doing, and the side hustle is going great. And then uh, maybe a couple of days later, uh, AJ contacts me like, Hey, you know, I heard you talk with my brother. Like, let's, let's have a phone call. And he's just, we just talked for a little bit. He's like, listen, we're trying to start something here. And at the time it was called uh Vayner NFT. And we have this, um, great person, Avery Akinini. She is working at Vayner Asia. And I think she got like, she got great accolades out there for like, I don't know, business woman, business person doesn't matter her gender but business person of the year out there and it's like we we want to get into this nft space and you have a lot of knowledge you know a lot of people so like it'd be very helpful if you can hop on board like what will it take like what's going on and and i was like well i'm at a school that i enjoy like i have my community there and and just turn into something that i just sitting there thinking like i could start making change i can start Maybe even helping my direct friends that are, you know, in this field, trying to get into this field as well. And I think I was the fourth person hired at Vayner NFT. And with that, I was able to get a lot of friends that were in Discord channels and links. And I was able to outfit them with jobs there. And they were great at building the Web3 space for some of the major communities that, you know, gain traction. And you just look at Vayner's. Vayner 3, which is called now because we did a name change from Vayner NFT into Vayner 3 early in the game. They're again trying to stay two steps ahead. And uh, the brands that they worked with um, and we were able to work with were just crazy. And the ideas and concepts that were, I was able to think of and utilize with other coworkers were nuts. Um, Nouns Dow um, being voted. Nouns Dow voted to be in a Super Bowl ad. Well, I linked in with him. Uh, I announced down. I'm just like, hey, do you guys want to be in a Super Bowl ad? He's like, well, we got to vote on this. Like, we can't just say yes. So, like, we go through Budweiser to kind of set this all up. But, like, you know, there's money put behind it if you're going to do start doing a Super Bowl ad. So we had to wait on the nouns to actually vote yes to be in a Super Bowl ad. And, you know, next thing you know, you're seeing something that you worked with other coworkers at the Super Bowl and you're seeing nouns glasses on a, on a, on a Bud Light can, you know, and it's just like, wow. Like I was, I was teaching, teaching kindergartners how to tie shoes and here it is eight months later. And there's something that was an idea amongst coworkers that's on TV. It's just nuts. Yeah. That was crazy. That was a, that was a crazy and fun moment too. I think everyone went, went, uh, went nuts. And more importantly, people went nuts uh, at Toads too, right? I think a uh, floor of Toads went to about 14 or 15 ETH uh, around that sort of same time, which was crazy. Um, so yeah, working with Gary and going through that was, um, it gave me another level of learning because never, I've never been in the business world. So I almost got like uh, a master's in business from the school of Boehner because I, I learned so much. Keep in mind, like I didn't own my own computer. <laughs> Like a couple months before working for Rainer, I had to buy a computer. Like I just bought in. So I learned everything at an accelerated rate from some of the smartest people in the world uh, while at Vayner coworkers. And a lot of those people were people in Discord that knew their stuff. And I, you know, told them to apply for a job. They were the best candidate for that job. I had nothing to do with the application process or anything like that. And next thing they're doing is they're still forging their way in this thread, Web three space. Uh, super cool, and uh, what 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 a story! And uh, and kudos to you for uh, making it all happen. So so you went through that sort of process with with Vayner, came out of that, and and now you've kicked off um, Avatars.xyz, 
what, I guess, what is it and what sort of inspired you to, to, to build this? For people to take their NFT projects, because you'd find a bottleneck of people trying to find advertising for their projects. So a lot of times they would either come into my show or look for another outlet to talk about their NFTs or go on to, at the time, Twitter spaces and talk about their projects. So I wanted people to take an AR filter of whatever NFT and make a name or voice for themselves. So I view myself almost as a new age Walt Disney and my crypto punk is Mickey Mouse. And you're able to have a clean slate and make a name and a face for yourself. Enter in spotty Wi-Fi. So then now Spotty Wi-Fi has an AR filter where he's able to, you know, produce songs behind, set himself different from, you know, the person who's just using their normal face. Because now, look at it now, everyone is using an AR filter in tons of capacities. G-Money, when he was anonymous, the utility of remaining anonymous but being able to still have talk shows. So first, you know, couple couple years First year or so, G Money was anonymous. He was still able to communicate, talk with major brands while being anonymous with that. And then also, there's a great designer behind this. I, I don't make these things, I make friends. They're again to know my own computer. So, there again, there's an artist behind this. So, he creates it, he gets the funds for it. I get more notoriety because people are coming back to Crypto Novo because they want an AR filter, and people are able to have functionality out of art. It's cool. And um, I mean, what do you sort of make of this moment? I mean, you know, I think we went through that bull run of AR, VR, metaverse type narrative. I mean, what's your sort of outlook on on this sort of space uh, as we currently uh, sort of sit in this market? Ah, this is where I'm two steps ahead, my friend, because I can see the future. People don't know what you can see the future. I'm not from the future, but I can see the future from the past because when these kids grow up, I get to see what they walk into school with and the cool things. Right now in these in the public schools in the in the US right here, at least the schools I'm around, which are melting pots. I mean, they I mean, there's not a strong eth- ethnic group in any any one of the schools that I've been in or around for a while. I see a lot of soccer jerseys and names I don't even know, and I know a lot of major soccer names. So these are smaller clubs from individual or uh you know, maybe different countries that aren't in the World Cup all the time. Fast forward to digital collectibles. Look at Fortnite, a free game. You know how much money people pump into that game? Man, my son must have taken V-Bucks, no relation to Gary V or anything like that, but taken V-Bucks and bought hundreds, plural of dollars of uh, of V-Bucks skins. I don't give them money for that. You know, those are holiday gifts. So. With that, those are how that that's how kids are showing their flex in the game. Getting on TikTok and dancing. Well, how are you gonna set yourself apart? Well, have have a digital collectible attached to it, you know. There's tons of people making content with their with their NFTs now. So that's what's gonna set people apart. Um just recently in Fortnite, I have and claim that I run around with uh Air Max's backpack on my back and everyone asks, Where are you getting that? Where'd you get that? Where'd you get that? Nike.swoosh or swoosh.nike, whatever it is. So Nike's already entering the game. So the seeds are planted. It just depends which ones are going to grow. Not all of them are going to take, you know, it might be Nike. It might be Adidas. It might be, you know, pudgy penguins, you know, you never know what's going to come out on top. But if you're not going to have any skin in the game, you're not going to learn and you're not going to grow. And when I mean skin, it doesn't need to be money. It can just be knowledge and time spent. So do you think um, it's not like sort of an instant catalyst with the existing sort of market base that we currently have, but it'll naturally just evolve over time as the younger generation starts moving and transitioning into, I guess, our, our sort of space, the crypto and digital sort of space? Oh, collecting back in the day is collecting something for ownership that you're pretty much now storing in a box that's collecting dust. Everything's now collected pretty much on your cell phones. If it's pictures, if it's... Uh, Alexor for your uh, Clash of Clans. If it's your, um, if it's your USD for a gambling site. If it's whatever it is, people have that stored on their phone. So to show something off um, is important to, for people. And sometimes it's not a car. And sometimes it's not your shirt or your shoes. Sometimes it's 
pulling your phone out and showing how beautiful your family is or the art that you created or the song that you made or the dance that you choreographed. And those are the things that people want to do. They want to create and now they have limitless boundaries to do that. So with that is back to ownership, back to the blockchain, where that ownership's going to go. Because you can produce anything you want and put it on, you know, TikTok and YouTube, but, you know, they pretty much own it. You're not going to get paid unless the sponsors want to pay you for it. But at the end of the day, you have the ownership of what you're trying to express. And right now, that's an NFT. Yeah, that's cool. I think uh, the Apple Vision Pro will uh, probably change that game a little bit more as well um, in, in, the, in, the, in the near future. Maybe just uh, shifting gears a little bit uh, back to um, punks uh, as we sort of you know round out our interviews. But if money wasn't an issue, what would be a dream punk? Do you think zombie? I've always wanted to trade up to get a zombie, and I I might have had that opportunity. I did have a hoodie. And this is going to maybe even be a segue to maybe one of the worst parts of my life, but one of the more validating aspects of me being in the space is me getting my punk stolen and my wallet. Oh, uh, yeah. I remember so, that. That was huge. Back to that. And that kind of, you know, like, why? what's the why for me being in this space? I always wanted to get a zombie. I've been a huge zombie fan from survival shows growing up don't really like super scary or bloody movies but zombie movies were the you know survival type movies into comic books walking dead i enjoyed and um didn't think i'd ever get to alien status um just too rare um at the time you know first collecting there was really only like one feasible that you can find apes out of the price range um, Nothing against apes, but I just like zombies better, and I thought they were more attainable. And that's kind of the uh, tr I tried to trade up to get to that status of getting like, and I even put it out there like, hey, do you want to twelve trade my twelve crypto punks for your ape or for your zombie? Do you want to trade this for the zombie? And I had those conversations going. So zombie to answer the question, and that's why I had the hoodie is kind of like almost a power play as that might be my ticket to get closer to a zombie. I sold a hoodie and then I rebought a hoodie. Um, I sold a hoodie for, I can't remember the exact Ethereum amount. It's foolish of me not to think of that right now, but I bought a similar hoodie minutes later for significantly amount less of Ethereum. Um, the person I sold it to and bought it from, he knew exactly what, he, uh, what I was going to do. And he was fine with that. He wanted the exact hoodie that I had. Fast forward to wallet getting drained. Being a nice person in the space has the crucial flaw with the wallet getting drained. Is I'd always approach people and invite them into meetings when they wanted to uh, have a meeting just to talk about their product, trying to get onto as many metaverses as I can, um, open my door up to someone on Discord to have a meeting about purchasing metaverse land not going to go into any specifics about any of that. That person invited another person on to try to establish land because I wanted to stream um, on that land. Reverse engineered a site. When I was trying to connect to the land, there was a gas transaction, which I hit no to. And that actually was um, not a MetaMask uh, valid thing. That was actually uh, a website. So when I clicked that, that actually made the transaction. And next thing I know, it was right then I almost felt it like instantly, like knew something was wrong, pit in the stomach, and went over and looked at OpenSea transaction and almost just hit the floor. Ah, uh, shit. Wait, so, so, so can you just walk through that just a moment? Like, you basically saw a MetaMask transaction pop up and you hit the no button, but it wasn't actually MetaMask. It was another overlay website that they built. Correct. Was it? Correct. That's crazy. So MetaMask crazy. was MetaMask was activated. I was actually pushing the button. It was masked on top with a website. That's crazy. Knew something was off like right away, like gut wrenching. Um, within seconds, I wanted to put a tweet out there. Uh, one, so 
it didn't happen to one, anyone else. But two, it was like pretty much like that's it. That's going to be it for me in this game. Like I'm, I'm out. Like this, this washes me clean. I don't know if I can recover um, from this. Yeah, it was, it was super, it was super harsh. Like right then. Yeah, I remember that moment when you, you sort of tweeted that. I think my, my, my gut just sank for you as well, right? Because I think that was just such an iconic PFP, and I just sort of felt, felt. Uh, felt so bad i mean uh for that to sort of especially to someone like Lee that's given so much to the space as well and has been so positive and upbeat for the space uh for that to happen was really really disappointing and i think a lot of people felt the same way as well it was losing your shadow something like i honestly looked at this ar filter every single day since it was created in business meetings and i'm not saying for like just oh just like looking in the mirror like hours and hours and hours, the G Gen hours, normal work hours, and then all of a sudden it's just like, dude, every every like I, I my I, I not only is my IP gone, like I just lost my face, I lost my shadow, I lost three years of work just to create this. Like I I can't just go into a meeting. Like I don't know, it was harsh. Yeah, I, I mean, you you even go to real life events dressed as uh, Novo as well. So, uh, I mean, it's, yeah, it looked pretty dumb dressed up as someone else's, you know, crypto punk. Another, another reason for the AR filter is I wanted to stay anonymous in the space and dressing up. And this can maybe play in later to a, another question that, you, that you'll think of later. Um, and that you'll, that I'll plant with you now is, um, in case I needed to go back to teaching because I'm on stage with Pussy Riot. I'm in the VIP room with Marshmallow. I'm at French Montana's house. And not saying like anything, I, I was doing anything wrong at any of those things. I was socializing, talking with normal people, but <laughs> the perception of parents sometimes or one parent or it could just go wrong. And I don't want to have that conflict. I don't want to have half clothed women who, you know, uh, uh, Nadia invited on stage pussy ride dancing and I wasn't touching grinding them or anything. I was <laughs> dancing as well, you know, enjoying myself just like all the other aliens, apes and zombies. And there's, there's more layers to it. Like I, my crypto punks a female. I was born a natural male. Like none of that matters to me, but like people's minds go crazy when they think of things like that. You know, like there's some States in the U S you can't go on stage like that. Like it's, and that's, that's neither here nor there. I, I'm, I approach all things with an open mind and dialogue and conversations important with all that. But, you know, losing my crypto punk was so harsh that the only thing, well, a lot of things, it was so harsh that it felt like you lost a loved one, you know, like worse than a breakup and no sleep, no food. But the thing that was helpful was the friends, was the 20,000 plus followers, was the Dario's of the world, the spotty Wi-Fi's of the world, the JRR tokens of the world, the grateful apes of the world who spent hours and hours and hours of their time to make something right that was wrong. And that didn't happen with famous actors and actresses that had their PFP stolen prior. It hasn't happened to significant members in the space in, in any regards, even in the Web2 space with, I don't know, maybe your bank account getting drained. And it almost validated the work I put in. It was, um, it was such a beautiful moment to see as well. I think in contrast, right, to see something bad like that happen to, to somebody like you who's such a kind person. Um, but it also was a beautiful moment when, you know, just to sort of see the NFT community just sort of rally like that and uh and uh and, and really support you maybe you could just talk, talk a little bit of detail about you know what actually happened and how they managed to help you get your your punk back like what 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 sorts of things happened first person i talked to is someone called beskar x beskar like the body armor in uh the man for the mandalorians bubba fett and best friend since third grade collector same thing comic books baseball cards he works at um, <clears throat> Leo Burnett, Publicis Media, one of the largest advertising agencies in the world. 
He's doxed as of now. But I've been telling him from the beginning, yo, you got to buy these crypto punks. Bro, buy these crypto punks. $200, $500, bro, buy a crypto punk. $700, buy a crypto punk. $1,000, you got to buy a crypto punk. Anyhow, didn't buy a crypto punk. But he learned along the way. And now he's teaching these Web2 brands the Web3 way. He called me up. He's like, you're going to get this punk back. Don't worry about it. Wheels are, mo are already in motion. Spotty Wi-Fi calls me up. Novo, and I'm, and I'm crying. Like, I'm not even saying the words. I, I'm, I'm crying. I mean, not even getting a word. And boogers coming out of my mouth, you know, <laughs> phone covered in, 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 in tears, laying on the ground, fetal position. Novo, just give me the blessing. Just say yes. We have a great idea. We want to have people donate art. And that art is going to be divided up about the amount of people who can uh, just buy a token for you. Save Novo. Go fund Novo token. They're going to buy a token. If 100 people buy it, we're going to take however many pieces of art are, are there and divide it up amongst those people. Sure, yeah, Spotty, whatever. You get the punk back. I don't care, man. No, no, no. Just hang in there, you know, get some sleep, you know, and get a Kleenex, clean yourself up. He didn't say that. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's it, it was people reaching out to Spotty and Beskar X because they knew that I hung out in DGen with them all the time. And they reached out to them like, we know Novo is an emotional wreck right now. Um, how can we help? And the community came together and did, like, in the States, they call it a Jerry Lewis telethon, where this actor came on, Jerry Lewis, and he just did a, a phone telethon, and he was on for hours and hours on, on end. And I believe they stayed on for 67 straight hours, just talking about the situation, talking about anything. If you're an artist and you want to uh, make a derivative out of Crypto Novo, or CryptoPunk3706, please submit it. And if you want to donate, you know, here's, here's the... And so there again, the community came together. They made a minting page. They made the smart contract for it. Behind me the whole time here, Max, these are all the derivatives that went through, 64 of them. There was uh, a music video by Six. Um, he made a music video with VR, with, uh, with Crypto Novo and VR. There was a digital art gallery um, created in VR for this event. Ehem Gallery in Paris hosted a physical gallery event, host, and uh, Pizza Dow donated pizza for it. Ledger gave away Ledger wallets for it. And man, I don't want to say I didn't do anything, but all I did is just try to help people along the way. So, like, thank you, NFT community. Thank you, Web3 community. Thank you for the people that have you know, kind hearts. And even if it is, you know, hitting that uh, retweet button, yeah, retweet back in the day or hitting like, I mean, those little things add up, even if you couldn't monetarily donate at all, everyone helped in their own little way. And back to the validation factor, it validates why I'm going to continue being in this space and helping people in this space because there's more good people than bad people. And plus, I truly believe in blockchain technology and it's all traceable. And, you know, good things happen to good people. And unfortunately, bad things happen to bad people. I'm not saying I want ill fate on anyone. I just want my crypto punks back. Yeah. Comma. But, um, but so how much did they raise in the end? They raised enough to buy the crypto punk back. And we stopped right there. There was a little bit of overflow, but we didn't want to get into too much more NFTs. They raised it back with, I mean, I can't remember the time frame, but it was like two days. I think it was like, maybe it was longer Crazy. than that. Maybe it was four or five days. The power of community. Uh, okay. So, so basically the guy stole it from you and then, okay. So you bought it back for 76.5 ETH. Floor. Yeah. Grand at the time. Just about floor. Wow. So the, the community came together and raised a hundred grand to get you all punk back in, in two days. That's, that's a beautiful story, man. And, uh, and I definitely want to go down in the history books of uh, punk lore as well, man. So, uh, so wow. Um, how did your life sort of you know, make of the space at that time when you were going through all of this? One, which a lot of people don't know, it's a huge tax burden, gigantic tax burden, horrible tax burden, because you're losing huge assets that the, our government does not um, does not give you a tax write-off on if someone steals them. 
right? Your house burns down or you you take capital gains losses because you, you know, maybe buy a, a stock that you lose your tail on. Like you can write that stuff off. This stuff, you don't write off. It's gone. So um, it's tough. And it leads me to like, I don't know what's going to happen next, you know, truthfully and honestly, because that, you know, happened right at the beginning of, of the, the year, you know, January 3rd, 4th, 5th, in that horrible time range. And it's just, you just don't know, you know, and then you're talking with, you're taking your time, not doing what you want to do, because you're talking with legal counsel on this and tax attorneys and stuff that, you know. It's a true must. More money, more problems. You can, you can, yeah, you can play that song for sure. Cause it's, uh, there's a lot to it and there's a lot that I don't know. And there's a lot I didn't know. And there's a lot I'm learning about. And there's a lot of unwritten rules. Um, as far as just like cryptocurrency, like the rules can, are still going to be written with tax laws and all that. Yeah. Well, uh, well, it's a good thing that you got your, your your punk back and it was a happy happy story uh, or happy ending at the uh, end of the day. But how would you? I mean, just talking about the positive community sort of vibes um, and transition that into a bit more around punks. How would you describe punk culture for you? Punk culture, some of the smartest people in the world, because they're around some of the smartest technology in the world, and they found those resources earlier than most people. And they have a value belief behind it, um, which builds the community. And that value could be belief could be, you know, maybe prospecting for for making profits down the future. Um, maybe it's you know creating a, a brand for their own company. Maybe it's a status symbol to get into that proper group or club because you have that type of wealth and you just want to be associated around those type of people. But right now, CryptoPunks is a conversation piece. And when you have a good conversation piece like that, you're going to start engaging more people. And it doesn't matter in what factor, positive or negative. And once you have more conversation, more people know about it. And once people, more people know about it, then the cycle continues. More conversation and people can come to their own, for instances, on it. And what I've seen from the beginning and nothing but from the beginning is the positive energy coming from the people who are pretty much almost making foundational pieces within this space. And you're seeing them branch off into helping Web2 companies really refortify and revisualize what future technology can bring to prior products. And that evolution is from the same people that started off in that punks discord. I mean, John and Matt made a digital, a digital asset on top of Ethereum blockchain that they gave away for free to everyone just to see what would happen. You know, they kept some for themselves and it took off like wildfire. Why? Because they're nice, positive people. Uh, the people that found out about how to get in touch or get these crypto punks, I don't even know where that spurred from. You know, was it the website popped up? Did they, you know, did they put it in on a, uh, on a, probably not on LinkedIn back then, you know, is it a Reddit? Was it a tweet? Like how did that start? And the right people found it and went with it. And and just in terms of culturally as well, um, how do you feel about V1 CryptoPunks? I think first is first and in that. So like if you're going to go back maybe 10, 20, 30, hundred years from now, people will look back on that just like comic books now. Um, I go to the flea market every Sunday morning, four in the morning before the sun rises. There are huge steals in there. We found a comic book that outdates the um, giant size X-Men number one because it was in a preview issue. So now people are you know, trying to find preview issues because they're a lower print run and those things are going for more money because you're previewing an issue that hasn't even come out yet. So like, maybe that's the preview issue that hasn't come out yet. You know. Um, the V1 punk community, which I was able to meet a whole host of them out in London, are awesome. They're cool people. Like, why would you view them any different than anyone else? And they're trying to do the same thing that we're trying to do here. Um, so don't have any angst or hate towards anyone or view anything differently. And if it does come to a point where V1s are worth more than, as I call, crypto punks or V2s in some eyes, 
then those V2s are going to be worth a heck of a lot more than two, right? So like if they flip and switch positions, then all right, that might happen too through evolution. But that evolution is through what the community has value in. So if, if people are sick of crypto punks, they might start buying V1s because they like that community base better. And um, how did you feel about the uh, Yuga acquisition of CryptoPunks? It's good. It gives them the home. I think the uh, CryptoPunks can be the adult in the room, um, you know, because the Bored Apes is a different brand style. And I think that's good to have different avenues and different and different ways of portraying your company being Yuga, you know. So if it is Bored Apes, you know, and you are in the swamp and you are on the uh, you are trying to, you know, get in that board, uh, that Bored Ape Yacht Club. Um, you know, and then you have a different avenue with CryptoPunks and what Noah's, you know, building by establishing CryptoPunks in major museums throughout globally now, um, and different establishments coming into the Yuga circle, meaning higher level CEOs, CFOs, peoples with C in their names from major video game companies coming in, you know, and that that definitely adds fuel to the fire. So having a billion dollar corporation investing in and acquiring in other communities is all part of the game, very similar to the dot com eras. And to create a voice, sometimes the amplification effect is the best results where you're able to, you know, maybe they don't have announcements to make for board apes this week or this month, but they can maybe you know, crutch on another one of their acquisitions to, you know, keep the conversation going, to try to get those news articles and headlines, to build those communities, to give people outlets if it's going to IRL parties or going to galleries or, you know, being connected in a digital space through gaming. Yeah. I, and if you had to look across the punk community and you've been in it for quite some time now, do you have... um a favorite punk or series of punks that, uh, that, that come to mind? I, I love what Spotty Wi-Fi is doing. I, I really think if people follow his model, we can, he can, they can make a systematic change to an industry that is just loaded with the people that have the money that can hit play on the radio waves. I mean, that's your biggest bang for the buck from what I've heard is playing something on the radio. But to get to that point is tough. And I think that's why songs back in the day are more nostalgic than current. It's because you were stuck in the car. You had to listen to those oldies. You had to listen to, you know, those songs played within the radio confines because you didn't have control of that button. So that's why those songs are stuck in your head. And that's why, granted, those songs are awesome. But, you know, the only rap you got to hear back in the day was Snoop Dogg, you know? Unless you got the CDs, you got, you know, to sneak some NWA in there at times, some, you know, some public enemy, but you weren't hearing those on the radio. So those weren't maybe highlights of your life because they weren't around you all the time. So the, the connectivity to build the roots to, you know, what happened to your past is going to just be in, in, in embedded in your brain moving in the future. So like, so spotty Wi-Fi, what he's accomplishing in the space is he's showing people there's outlets to create to produce and you know to even bring in people because he's bringing you know bun b he's bringing pe people in from the web 2 world you know he's he's been to death row records and has had you know uh conversations with snoop dogg so they're aware of what he's doing in the space and he's continuing the build and, you know he's got spotty land go growing in decentraland so now he's bringing in web 2 talent into the central end there again onboarding step educational steps bringing people on so you know tassel hats off to spotty wi-fi and what he brings and uh and his conversation and he he sticks up for himself too because he's trying to create a name and a brand uh for himself and a, a way of living just like all the other artists out there it doesn't matter if you're a musician if you're uh, a painter a digital artist uh you know doesn't matter who you are he's just trying to help people find a way for themselves that's cool no i like i like spotty's tracks they're pretty catchy so uh need to uh try and uh get on top of more of some of the stuff he's doing and uh if you could pass on a message to the next owner of your punk 3706 what would you like to say to them 
son, take care of this punk. Pass it on to my grandson, your son or daughter. Or if you don't decide to have kids, then, you know, give it to your sister. But yeah, have fun with it. And this will be the connective piece to other major crypto punk owners that pass down their crypto punks to the next generation because uh, that's what I'm planning to do because I like having fun and continue having fun with uh, people in the space. Awesome. Novo, thank you so much for uh, joining Punkcast. This was uh, an awesome opportunity to sort of finally speak to you and unpack your story. Are there any sort of final closing comments and you know what's the best way for people to find you? A message to people listening. Uh, one, a way that you can find me is at CryptoNovo311. I chose 311 at the end. It's an influential band, very positive members in that band. Been to dozens, plurals of shows. The community members at the show are a very bo- positive community. You can have everyone jumping as one organism at one time, mosh pitting, but still able to help pull each other up if someone gets knocked down. Uh, the lead singer um, ends every show with something that I've uh, changed just a little bit, but it's uh, stay positive and love life. I think that's important to say. I say that at the end of all my shows and broadcasts. doesn't matter what life it is, just stay positive and love life. Peace. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks, Nova. Guys, that wraps up an episode of Punkcast for the week. Thank you so much for uh, tuning in for uh, this week. And we'll be back next week with another awesome punk. Bye for now.